Thank you, Celeste. Can you all hear me? Is this working? And um, for such a wonderful and wonderfully apt introduction, because actually, I mean, it's funny that you should mention the tempestuous marriage with the academy, because parts of this lecture, which I recently wrote, actually part of it this afternoon, um, reads like, like the testimony at the divorce hearing at the end of that tempestuous marriage. So. Uh, it's an essay. The essay is in uh, seven parts. And, and I say that because I, I, every time I give a talk, I, I number the sections now. Because I started to notice, um, as a listener to lectures and readings, that, that I would feel a sort of panic, not knowing when the thing was going to be over. <laughs> you know, this will last forever. So, um, so it's in seven parts. So when you get to six, you know that uh, the end is inside. And, and also, um, it has three titles, this essay. Not out of indecision, actually, but I don't know what. Because the three titles. Anyway, here they are. How I Became an Art Critic, or Against Jargon, or The Moral Obligation to Be Clear. Everything I'm about to say is true, except for the lie I've already told an admission that will only further discourage those already understandably wary, wary of an essay with three titles. I'm not an art critic. I'm a novelist who writes about art. When I reviewed museum shows in New York and elsewhere twice or three times a month, the brief bio I was sometimes asked to provide included the phrase, quote, she writes regularly about art for the Wall Street Journal. Now I write only rarely for the journal, not because I don't enjoy it, but because it takes so much time, and because I'd begun to notice that the pressure to come up with a catchy lead sentence was totally ruining my pleasure in looking at art. The last piece I wrote for the journal was about a show of tin, tiny tin toy cars in the collection of a Japanese businessman on display at the Japan Society in Manhattan. Something about the convergence of art, play, history, and commerce the cars originally made from discarded tin cans contributed to the recovery of Japan's post-war economy and helped inspire the rise of its auto industry, made me think the story needed to be written for the good reason that no one else was going to write it. Neither an art historian nor an art critic, I imagined that I could, and I did, write a brief biography of Caravaggio. I've written about photography, long essays for Harper's Magazine about Diane Arbus and Weimar painting, prefaces to monographs, introductions to art books and gallery catalogs on artists from Robert Mangold to Elizabeth Murray, Terry Winters to Helen Levitt and Louise Bourgeois. I like confronting the challenges these essays represent, among them the peculiar demands of writing about abstract art, especially, though not necessarily, if I think I understand the artist's work, and especially, though not necessarily, if I like it. How I began to write about art is a story I want to tell, not because it's about myself, but about art and language, and about the problem of using language to communicate clearly and comprehensibly about visual art, or about anything, really. Part one, my childhood. The following passage is from a short story called Girlandayo that I wrote in the late 1980s. My father was a doctor. He loved medicine and art and loved especially those places where the two seemed to him to coincide. Paintings of saints curing lepers. Van Gogh with his digitalis distorted eyesight. Monet, whose retinal degeneration my father pronounced to have influenced his later work. And most of all, astigmatic El Greco, his view of Toledo that we lingered before gazing at the roofs and spires and nighttime sky that El Greco with his bad vision had seen and painted as squiggles. My father walked briskly through the museum, visiting his favorites as if he were making hospital rounds. And in my slippery party shoes, I skated after him." Unquote. My father did take us to museums to look at paintings of diseases. I have since learned that this is not uncommon among doctors. Charcot, the pioneer neurologist, and P.T. Barnum of hysteria was a gifted draftsman who used his skills to record anatomical abnormalities observed at home and abroad. My aunt, a high school biology teacher who lived on the top floor of our house in Brooklyn, 
owned an enormous volume of Sienese art with, or at least in memory, excellent reproductions. I fixated on these paintings at an early age, partly for their fairy tale quality and their liberal use of Cinderella pink for castles and crenellated wall cities. Sienese painting is the childhood art love that has stayed with me longest, unlike other enthusiasms, such as my adolescent enthusiasm for the melted clocks of Salvador Dali. My other childhood art memory takes place before the age at which we learn that naked people in a painting are not naked people, but art. It also shows how much the world has changed in 50 years. Nowadays, every toddler knows all about erectile dysfunction. But in the 1950s, finding the bare ass of Velasquez's Roque Venus in another of my aunt's art books was like finding someone's father's secret porn stash only better because it was a great painting and looked more like flesh than a photograph of flesh, or for that matter, like flesh. A half dozen kids from my block gathered in the hot attic and piled on the book like puppies. It was like an orgy with everyone fully dressed and no one touching ourselves or each other. We went home and guiltily avoided one another for a few days, then forgot the Velasquez nude, at least as a collective experience. The memory reinforces my belief in the power of art. Consider a pack of Brooklyn kids communing with Velasquez, who, by that point, had been dead for 300 years. Two, my art education. I remember painting ice skaters at Rockefeller Center. I spent days on it. I was 10 years old. I remember the painting looking like the work of some outsider art grandma. After that, my drawing and painting became more self-conscious and static. I knew I'd be a literature major at school, but I also loved art, so that when I went to college, I planned to take art history courses. For some reason, I thought this was something no one else would be doing. In fact, many people were doing it, and they all knew each other from prep school and skiing vacations at Davos. The introductory art history survey was traditionally taught at lunchtime. The lecture hall was overheated, and when the lights dimmed so the professors, each lecturing on his own historical period, could show us slides, everyone fell asleep. For the exams, we had to be able to identify and date hundreds of images, but there was a flip-through study aid that came with the course that could be memorized in a weekend. Even so, I almost failed Fine Arts 13. I couldn't write the papers, a new and humbling experience for someone who had gotten into college because I knew how to write papers. The problem started with Titian, one of my favorite painters. We were assigned a paper on the rape of Europa in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, one of my favorite museums. I met my section teacher in his office, which was decorated in the Oxford Donish style that some Harvard tutors affected. I remember him wearing owlish eyeglasses long before they became ironic. <laughs> he patiently explained why he'd given me a D minus. I wish I had my paper now. It was probably awful. Even so, I would like to read what I wrote and his critique. Sitting in his office, I had no idea what he was talking about. I figured that if I kept nodding my head, our conversation would eventually end. I don't know how I finally passed the course, except that, as I've since learned, it's more trouble to fail a student than it's worth. That was my last art history course. It was too upsetting not to be able to read or speak a language I was supposed to have learned, though no one seemed able to tell me when or where I was supposed to have learned it. My section leader later became a well-known curator who sometimes appears on PBS to provide <laughs> sound bites about painting. When I began to write about art, I hoped he was reading my reviews, but by then I'd learned there wasn't a chance that I'd, he'd remember I'd been in his class. Most of my art education has come from my husband, who's a painter. He likes to get up close to paintings. Once at the Getty in Los Angeles, I walked into a room to find him blowing on a 17th century Dutch cityscape. A guard came running over, and my husband showed him a hair from the restorer's brush, fluttering, stuck to the canvas. The guard said, that's not good. <laughs> I'm always interested in the distance we learn to stand from art. A question reopened for me recently when my granddaughter was encouraged by a museum guard to touch a computer screen that made the exhibition more interactive, but later yelled at by the same guard for touching the glass protecting a painting. 
In the early 1990s, the editor of the Arts and Leisure page of the Wall Street Journal asked if I wanted to write about art for the journal. By then, I'd written several novels, magazine pieces, and travel essays, which touched tangentially on art, but I'd never focused specifically on a museum exhibition. I reminded the editor I had no art history background. The editor said that wasn't a problem. He wanted someone who could write lucidly. He said he couldn't find an art critic who could do that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Five, my first assignment. My first assignment was to write a show, to write about a show of David Smith's sculptures at the Storm King Art Center near Newburgh, New York. I knew something about Smith's work, which is to say I could visualize several of his sculptures. I knew he'd had a studio, Sculpture Fields, really, in upstate New York. Once, I'd met a writer who had attended a party after which Smith was killed in a car wreck. That wasn't enough for 800 words. I wanted to do well. This was slightly pre-internet, at least for me, so I went to my local public library. Now it seems impossible that I could have had the time to drive there. Now, of course, I spent that time on the internet. I borrowed a book on David Smith, the only one they had. It was Terminal Ironworks, The Sculpture of David Smith by Rosalind Krauss. It would be a lie to say I remember exactly which paragraph made me burst into tears. So I will try to locate a paragraph something like it. Quote, this is from Ros Cross's book. Quote, the acknowledgement of the relation between the two series might also prompt the realization that the QB's quality of detached surfaceness, which seems to radiate from the splayed frontality guaranteed by the fixed viewing point, did not result from a range of choices open to Smith from which he arbitrarily picked this one or that one. Once he'd assumed the burden of achieving sculptural presence, Smith's formal de decisions became the self-generated directives of a quest. I Excuse me. I read and reread it. What was splayed frontality? Achieving sculptural presence. My past had come back to haunt me, the D minus on the Titian paper. In contrast to the jargon choked prose that I've tried to read since then, the critical writing of Rosalind Krauss now seems as straightforward as a phone book. Recently, looking through her terminal ironworks, I was surprised by how much I comprehended and vaguely sorry for having remembered it as a dark stew of neologisms and tortured constructions, though I must say I had no more desire to read it than now than I did 20 years before. When I mentioned this to Peter Sheldahl, the art critic for The New Yorker, he said he thought the problem with Krauss's writing wasn't comprehensibility, but charm, a basic requirement for art criticism, he said, since otherwise no one needs it. On the way home from the library, I wept over Rosalind Krauss's book until my husband reminded me that I'd been hired not to write like that. I persevered. I read more about David Smith. I went to see the show at the Storm King Center. I studied the handouts and wrote down what I saw. I tried to write in a way that informed readers who knew nothing about David Smith without insulting the intelligence of readers who knew a lot. Now, when I reread that essay, it's quite a bit worse than I remember. I mean, my own essay. It uses too many adjectives. It sounds like something written by someone who was as nervous as I was. Quote, in the 32 years since his death in a pickup truck, truck wreck, David Smith has become, quite apart from the beauty and historic importance of his work, a totemic figure, our Vulcan in welder's goggles, immensely innovative, massively productive, lent an abandoned locomotive factory in Italy in which to create a piece for the Spoleto Festival, Smith, claiming a misunderstanding, made 26 sculptures in one month. He was, together with Pollock, arguably the greatest talent of an era when art was still considered, at least by artists, a matter of life and death. In their freedom from cynicism, in the grandeur and purity of their drive to hack away at the last tendrils tying us to Europe and carve out the unmapped territory of American art, that generation of artists looks in 90s retrospect like pilgrims or early Christians. A genial, macho beatitude radiates from Smith's work and from the photos of the Clark Gable-esque artist included in the fields of David Smith." Unquote. Pilgrims or early Christians? A genial, macho beatitude? I might not write that now, but in the final third of the piece, something interesting, at least to me, years later, starts to happen. 
Comparing the Alexander Lieberman photos of Smith's work at Bolton's Landing with the way they looked at the Storm King Center, I wrote, quote, the differences suggest the chasm between the factory yard and the golf course, between Smith's, quote, overgrown, weedy, deeply rutted fields and the surgically manicured lawns of the outdoor sculpture museum. The Smith this is still a quote. Though Smith arranged his outdoor pieces with care, pictures of them suggest white hot objects newly forged and set out to cool. By contrast, the Storm King show has the static placidity of an upscale memorial park and inside the museum, gleaming parquet floors conjure up visions of the bear-like Smith stomping across them in his mythically gigantic size 14 by some reports steel-toed welder's boots. Smith himself was unsure for a time about the whole idea of outdoor sculpture, which he dismissed as royal. One assumes that what spooked him was the specter of the statuary at Versailles, the spit and polish of Europe. And indeed, an aura of the manorial and aristocratic clings to the well-groomed landscaping and stone pathways of Storm King. A stranger to Smith's work would have to study the photos and video very closely in order to understand his ethos the American art worker with torch ablaze in the sculpture factory." Unquote. It's not great art writing. Mythically a gigantic size 14 by some report steel-toed welder's boots could easily have been cut to size 14 welder's boots. But even so, I prefer this to a consideration of splayed frontality and achieving sculptural presence. Six, against jargon. Every year, I assign my students, barred college undergraduates, whom I ask to write a, write, a, write a weekly response paper on the literature assignments they read, to bring to class a passage of jargon, any kind of jargon, literary, political, art historical, scientific, and translated into English. The passages are inevitably pompous and inflated, and in translation, nearly always collapse like souffles, revealing the often simple or even banal idea concealed beneath the weight of verbiage. Here's one of my favorites chosen at random for a book entitled The Artificial Kingdom, A Treasury of the Kitsch Experience by Celeste Alal Quiaga. Quote, dethroned, the symbol's primary meaning is relegated to a peripheral status. However, as a devalued text, it provides the basis for allegorical meaning, which then adds its own layer of signification, enabling a dialectical reading of its predecessor. While the symbol depends on an allegory for its survival in time, the allegory is contingent on the symbol as a founding text." Unquote. Lately, I've become especially allergic to various sorts of jargon that have evolved as a response to certain discomfort about academic methods and practices. So in the social sciences, the anthropological research subject has metamorphosed into the actor. Doubtless, these individuals are more likely to see themselves as actors in their own lives than as subjects of a study. But the relationship in this context is one of researcher and subject. It strikes me as counterproductive to seek scientific truth while using language meant to codify or even obscure the basic nature of that search. I also ask my students to write in their notebooks in block letters the question, would I say this? And I tell them to look at the page and ask themselves that before using in their papers a construction such as, quote, thus it can be said that, or furthermore it can be argued that, and countless other more convoluted locutions that they have been taught to write in a language or a dialect that I think of as paper ease. What's most striking about these exercises is the sudden and often drastic improvement in the writing of students who are, who are told that they need not sound professorial or learned, but that their sole obligation is to be interesting, logical, and clear. Seven, models. One of the perks of writing regularly on art was that for several years, I received cartons of art books to peruse for the annual gift book Christmas round review. In these pieces, I discuss the quality of the reproductions and, in some cases, the greatness of the artists or the freshness of the book's conception. But I rarely mention the texts, which were too often colorless or unreadable, passages of prose that seem to have given up on the challenge of competing with the illustrations. One memorable exception was Sister Wendy's Odyssey by Sister Wendy Beckett, the eccentric, flutey-voiced British nun who, during the 1990s, hosted a series of popular documentaries on art history for the BBC and PBS. 
Among the charms of her performance was the innocent gusto with which she would expound on the lush, concupiscent bodies of Baroque and Renaissance nudes. Her books don't even look like real books, but like objects offered as incitements to get people to support public TV. And, and yet, on nearly every page was evidence of Sister Wendy's gifts as a writer, and the gift she gave me was the suggestion, one that would have been hard to extract from much contemporary art criticism, that it might be useful to simply describe what one saw, what there was to see in a painting. Here, for example, is her helpful meditation on Poussin's landscape with the ashes of Phocion, based on a story from Greek mythology about a widow's efforts to collect the scattered ashes of her husband. Quote, Poussin shows us the majestic landscape of the classical world where all is order and dignity. The temple rises in perpendicular power, surrounded by the severe stateliness of masculine architectural authority. Even the great trees are disciplined and regular. The world moves quietly about the important affairs of commerce and takes no <coughs> heed of the injustice done to a loser. Phocion's wife, whose very name is forgotten, crouches to her loving task in the foreground, light gleaming on her downcast head and eager arms. Her companion is clearly terrified, keeping an anxious lookout for observers, but the widow is solely concentrated on what she has set her heart on doing, giving her husband immortality. Her humble but passionate activity in the earth is in painful contrast to the clear calm of the background, the high and barren mountain, the noonday torpor of the passers-by, the motionless trees, and the distant cloud-shadowed sky." Unquote. Perhaps the more we know about art, the more elementary or elegant Wendy Beckett's writing seems. In its calm refusal to be anything less than clear, Sister Wendy's Odyssey encouraged me to seek out writers notable not only for the grace and transparency of their style, but for the incisiveness and originality they bring to the act of looking at a painting. Having written a book about books that the would-be writer might want to read before beginning to write fiction, I could probably write another about the works that can guide us toward writing lucidly about art. Such a list would range widely, from Van Gogh's letters to Baudelaire's essays. It would include Vasari and Roger Fry, Bernard Berenson and Meyer Shapiro, Ingrid Rowland, Dave Hickey, and Helen Langdon. But let me give a few examples written in recent years. As my editor at the journal must have believed or hoped, the most lucid writing about visual art is often done not by professionals, but by amateurs. Among them, the poet Frank O'Hara, whose essay on David Smith appears in a remarkable collection entitled Writers on Artists, with contributors that include Calvino, Sartre, Art Ashbery, Elizabeth Bishop, Catherine Ann Porter, and Willa Cather. One sentence of O'Hara's will perhaps convey some sense of the way he melts clarity, charm, observation, reflection, and instruction. Quote, the QB series presents the stainless steel volumes balancing on one another, signaling like semaphores, climbing into the air with the seeming effortless and spontaneity of a masterful drawing while retaining the sobriety of their daring defiance of gravity, a concept the meaning of which Smith had pondered often in his career, both as a challenge and limitation. Of course, there are excellent art critics who do this for a living and still retain a sympathy for and awareness of an audience larger than the colleagues they meet regularly at the walkthroughs at which curators discuss a new exhibition. One such professional is Robert Hughes, who is not only a first-rate writer, but is, who has been brave in expressing views and predictions about the future of art, many of which have already come true. Here, for a fourth opinion of sorts, is Hughes on David Smith, a passage that does what such writing can do to help us see a work of art in new ways. Quote, placing sculpture outdoors in natural light came to matter greatly to Smith by 1957, when he embarked on a series of pieces in stainless steel, first the sent Sentinels, and then the last series, the Cubies. At first, he had divided feelings about outdoor sighting, since he felt it was, quote, historic or royal and has nothing to do with a contemporary art concept. But then he realized that, especially with the highly reflective material of stainless steel, 
one could bring sunlight and color into the work, bring sunlight and color into the work to develop the illusion of surface and depth. From it, he wanted to make, quote, a structure that can face the sun and hold its own against its blaze and power. The silvery plains of the Cubies, scribbled with stuttery, glittering lines by the rapid drawing of the power grinder, respond better to sunlight or starshine than to the static lighting of a museum. They create a grand architectural presence with overtones of portals and sacrificial altars. Such a range of expression culminating in the Cubies had never been seen in America before and has not reappeared since. O. David wrote his best friend Robert Motherwell in one of the most moving valedictions ever offered to a dead American artist by a living one. You were as delicate as Vivaldi and as strong as a Mack truck. And so he was." End quote. Before leaving the subject of models, I want to quote at some length from a writer who is, in my view, one of the best critics working today. That is, the critic Sanford Schwartz, who, quote, writes regularly on art for the New York Review of Books, and whose reviews can be reread long after the shows they describe have been dismantled. This is from his essay on Watteau, an artist who, be, who, to be honest, had always mystified me until Schwartz's essay inspired me to look harder and look again. Quote, Pierrot stands stock still on a little rise or wall. Below and behind him, passing by in a sort of chorus line formation, are four people dressed in theatrical costumes and a donkey. At first you think the scene takes place outdoors and the people in the background are standing in a trench or ravine. But they're jammed so close to Pierrot and the sky is so flat and shallow you wonder if this isn't a theater with Piero standing on a set and the people and animal behind him standing on the floor of the stage. What do they think of Piero? That's the question we keep coming back to. The last two figures seen on the left of Piero's legs are the donkey and the man in the black outfit who rides the donkey. This man, his outfit identifies him as the comic character called the doctor, is the spookiest figure of them all. We know his grin and the upturned motion of his eyes from real life, and probably can't remember if anyone other than Watteau has put this expression in a painting. The doctor has a face that you might encounter in a cafe when you sense that someone is looking at you. You turn, and sure enough, someone who seems to be engaged with his friends at his own table glances at you at that instant. You may be a little unnerved and think his face implies, I've been watching you all along. Yet perhaps he meant nothing by his look. Maybe he's turned involuntarily because he senses you're about to look at him. Watteau's doctor seems to glance out at us conspiratorially and say with his wet lips, so how do you like our Mr. Nothing up there? The painting isn't about self-pity, though it may seem so if you've never really looked at Pierrot's face. Sleepy, hot, moist around the eyes, developing a double chin with the impacted look of someone whose nasal passages are permanently clogged. He's the ultimate adenoidal schlemiel. Though he's a comic actor, this man could symbolize all artists. Is he dreaming about himself? Are the people at the bottom of the picture his conception of his audience? They are deliberately beneath him at his feet, yet they seem to deliberately ignore him. What actually happens is that they don't see him and this gives the picture its tension. You can't help feeling that you are Perot and that the people ought, in some way, to acknowledge your presence." End quote. Not one word of jargon has been used. There has been no mention of detached surfaceness or splayed frontality. The writing is, in fact, beautiful, and no matter how we may feel, about the slightly coercive use of the second person you in criticism. The fact remains that having read this passage, we will never again look at Watteau's painting in quite the same way, or in my case, with the same blinkered and uncomprehending vision. The reason I wanted to write a brief biography of Caravaggio, a subject about which I knew only the bare outlines of a life, and did know that at least one excellent biography, and since then another of Caravaggio had been written, was partly because I had loved his paintings for decades, since one of my sons came from, from sixth grade, excited about a painter who had killed someone in a duel after a tennis game. 
And it was partly that by then, I would felt I would figured out something about how to use language to describe a painting. It was pure <coughs> pleasure to sit at a desk in Rome and try to put into language the experience at looking at the paintings I'd visited on a sort of pilgrimage rotation several times a week. The art writing I'm proudest of appears in that little book, and I'll read you just a few paragraphs I remember having liked, at least when I wrote them. The first is about, a, is about Caravaggio's rest on the flight into Egypt, a canvas bisected by a beautiful angel in the middle with his back to us. On one side of the angel is Mary and the infant Jesus. On the other is Saint Joseph and his donkey. Quote, it's Joseph who most compels us with his weariness and weight, his graying beard and unkept hair, and the compassionate fixity of his gaze, and the furrows beneath his receded hairline. No one remotely resembling him has yet appeared in Caravaggio's work. But we will see more and more of him as, over the next few years, the artist trades seduction and charm for complexity, power, and greatness. The violin playing angel may be the official celestial messenger, but it is Saint Joseph who is the harbinger of what is to come as Caravaggio exchanges loyalty to his patrons for loyalty to the truth, and as he finds the courage to portray what is not yet fully present in the painting and what at the same time matters most, the dust and grit, the wear and tear of Saint Joseph's journey. The second passage is about Caravaggio's painting, The Martyrdom of St. Peter. Already strapped to the instrument of his death, the apostle is portrayed as his cross as being raised in preparation for his crucifixion upside down. Again, Caravaggio's vision departs from earlier conceptions, which mostly portray the saint with his torment well underway, his body fully inverted, images in which the cruelty of his punishment has the unintended effect of distancing us from his plight. Unless we ourselves stand on our heads, we cannot see the saint's expression. And so the dying upside down martyr has an effect already ceased being human. Caravaggio's solution allows us to look directly into the suffering face of the saint, even though his eyes evade ours as he drifts toward wherever he must go in order to endure the pain that awaits him. The key to the painting's power lies in the horrifying naturalism of the way in which Peter holds his body and his head. We feel that the saint's uncomfortable pose has been copied directly from life, that this is exactly how we would attempt to ease our misery, the precise angle at which we would lift our backs and strain our necks had we been forced into that position on that hard wooden plank. Perhaps Caravaggio achieved this effect by leaving his model in position long enough so that the stand-in for the saint assumed the pose that would minimize his discomfort. The overall impression is one of overpowering loneliness, even though the apostle is involved in a sort of group activity, a species of collective labor with the three burly workmen expending all their energy on the physically demanding task of lifting Peter's cross. Of the three, to have their backs turned to us, the third one's face is in shadow. You feel that if you could see them, they would be expressionless, utterly impassive and stolid. They take no pleasure in their work, nor do they bother with guilt or remorse. They're simply doing a job they've been hired to do, a job that needs to be done as efficiently as possible and with the least amount of wasted effort. As with each of Caravaggio's paintings, especially from this period, you can see him learning how to do something both marvelous and new. Here, what he's discovering is the effect that can be achieved by focusing our attention on the mindless, menial labor involved in martyrdom and its aftermath, a theme that will intensify the gravity and beauty of one of his late masterpieces, The Burial of St. Lucy. And here, for the first time, he boldly insists on the true appearance transcribed from life of the calloused hands and rugged backs of the laborers who carry out the killing of those whom the powerful want silenced. Most importantly, he is exploring the magnitude of the compassion that he is able to make us feel for the innocent, suffering victim of a horrible crime. Everything in his portrayal of Peter, the intersecting furrows in his brow, the sharp crease traversing his stomach, 
the way that one of the workers embraces his shins while raising the cross without any perceptible awareness that he is touching a living human being. All of it increases our sympathy until we feel that the actual execution is transpiring in front of our eyes and that we have to turn away because we can hardly stand to see it. Seven. You know, this is the second seven. This is, a, <laughs> it's the last section. I mean, I just realized my mathematical uh, abilities are pretty bad. Seven, eight. The, mo the moral obligation to be clear. Some of you may recognize a paraphrase of the Lionel Trilling essay, The Moral Obligation to be Intelligent. With due respect to Trilling, I'm not sure that intelligence, whatever that means, and however we define it, is a moral obligation, especially since we have come to realize how many kinds of intelligence exist. Is the intelligence of the dancer or the carpenter less valuable than that of the scholar or philosopher? But clarity is clarity it's far easier to recognize and identify. To paraphrase again, this time Chief Justice Potter Stewart's definition of pornography, you know it when you see it. By now, some of you may be sensibly asking yourselves, what is your problem exactly? Whom really does jargon hurt? What finally is the harm in speaking and writing in a semi-private language that can be only st understood only by a tiny fraction of the population? My answer, I have to say, is that it hurts us all. Every day, our society is paying the price extracted by opacity, by unclear and inexact language, by the conscious or unconscious effort on the part of corporations, government, and the media to persuade the population that the most basic processes affecting their lives are and should be and will forever be beyond their comprehension. How different our culture would be if certain things were explained to us in terms that all of us could understand, the roots of our ongoing financial crisis, the relation of our economy to that of the wider world, the costs and benefits of foreign wars, the list goes on and on. I'm not suggesting that the jargon-riddled consideration of the work of David Smith or the meaning of kitsch is directly related to our inability to understand, to quote one corporate CEO I heard recently on the news, quote, how deep a hole we're in. But I'm not saying it's unrelated either. Every time one makes someone feel that a question cannot be answered or a subject cannot be discussed in a comprehensible way, discourages that person from asking another question and another. Every time we use language to inflate and disguise a relatively straightforward idea, we are enabling the powers that decide our fates to cloak our reality in subterfuge and obfuscation. And how much more dangerous and pernicious that mystification is when it is associated with education, with learning, when it is used to winnow and narrow and intimidate those who want to learn something new to find something out. Life is too short to bore one another and ourselves. Knowledge is too precious to save for the few and exclude the many. The next time we sit down to write something, it's worth asking, as I tell my students to ask, would I say this? It costs nothing to be clear. It takes less time and effort than it requires to reinvent the language for each discipline and area of study. If an idea seems oversimple when it is stripped of its armor of jargon, perhaps it's a simple idea. But there's nothing wrong with a simple idea or with transparent language. Write in ways we can understand. Let us in on the secret. Thank you. Um, I wonder if in the art criticism that you admire and you write, um, if you ever talk about paint quality and color and uh, the, seem, the examples you gave seem to be very story oriented mm -hmm. and the effect that the painting has, which is important, but painters are usually really interested in paint quality too. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I do because, because I've had to write uh, 
about, well, you know, when you're writing about the work of, of Robert Mangold, for example, there's no story. I mean, when you write, it's one of the things I meant about writing about abstract art. You really have to talk about those things and, and, and paint quality, color, the line, the quality of the line, and so forth. So, so they, certainly, they certainly come up. I mean, you're right. The, the, um, the examples I picked, it now occurs to me, now that you said so, are very narrative. But, but, but when you're writing about art in which there is no narrative, you're really forced back upon those issues. But again, I think that you can write about them in, in very clear language. Because, because when you hear, for the most part, I mean, I know a lot of painters, they, don't, they themselves don't talk that way in general. So even though they're, they're you know, I'm, that is, they don't talk in jargon, for the most part. I mean, the ones who are my friends. So, um, so I think it's, again, I think it's possible to write about the, the very things you're talking about, but, but to do it comprehensively. I mean, I'll tell you, it was hard to write about Robert Mangold. I mean, I wound up, I can't even tell you the things that I wound up, I don't know, I was talking about Indian music. I mean, you know, just, you know, because it's like a line down the canvas. To, 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 to get 2,000 words out of that without jargon was, was quite a challenge. So <laughs> somehow it worked. Um, I wanted to thank you. That was very good. I like your, uh, the argument against jargon as an art history student can be a little challenging. But um, I am curious uh, about your presentation and why you didn't choose to show the, the pictures you were talking about as slides. I think it was, it was either Baxin or Panofsky who said that the ruse of art history is that everyone else can see what can see it too. You're just describing what everyone else can see. So I was wondering um, if maybe in future presentations you would be interested in actually showing that. The That's such, that such a good idea. Them. You know, I'm so, I'm so technologically challenged that I can't even put a PowerPoint demonstration mm -hmm. together. I've tried. And they just wind up, you know, you know, I just wind up showing pictures of my family by accident. <laughs> so, and, and in fact, when I was, after I wrote the Caravaggio book, that same issue came up and I said, absolutely, absolutely. So I had all these slides of Caravaggio and, you know, on a, on a computer and, the, and half of them were upside down and half of them, it was just terrible. So it's just, uh, you're right, it, sh it would be great. I just can't, it's just, an, you know, it would be a much better idea. But I'm so, I'm so inadequate to the task that I, all I have is words. And, you know, my hope is that people will go out and look at the paintings. Um, I noticed you, you put science in the areas which are very prone to jargon. Um, but I think it's certainly true, and not, uh, not defending jargon, but it's certainly true that any good working science paper, uh, almost nobody in this room will be able to understand a damn thing about it. Um, and I was just thinking about how you deal with that funny area that is difficult, but actually appropriately difficult. And, and, and maybe I could link that to an anecdote. Um, I, I totally am on your side in terms of that academic writing should be clear and lucid. And I so prided myself on my first book that was written in real English, you know, that an actual human being could understand. And I can remember just how deeply hurt and angry I was when a, another intelligent friend outside the academy said they tried to read it and couldn't, couldn't read it. It was much too, it was in some arcane academic and, and I wanted to sort of shake her and, and, and hold her down and actually read my, you know, beautifully crafted, lucid paragraphs. How do you deal with that? Uh, that's to say, you know, jar is, jargon could be like, you know, being a tourist. It, 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 it's something that applies to other people and not to oneself. How, how do you ever... Uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, you're right. I mean, there's... Uh, there, you know, uh, I'm sure there are very elemental works of, let's say, biochemistry that I could not possibly understand, not because they're written in jargon, but because I don't understand the definitions of the noun, the simplest definitions of the nouns. But, but again, you know, it depends, it depends partly on audience. I mean, that is, if you're writing for people who, who you have a fairly, you're fairly confident can understand the vocabulary. Then, then, then it's it's different. I mean, but that's not jargon. The, I guess what I'm saying is there's a difference between jargon and vocabulary, and 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 to to make up words that aren't actually words, in the interest of making it as as full of jargon as possible, 
it's quite different. You know, but then also many, you know, science can be written and written beautifully for people. You know, the, I mean, it, it depends on audience. Oliver Sacks, well, if you take, for example, an, an Oliver Sacks piece, it would be possible to translate that back into jargon, huh. right? I mean, you could take one of those neurological cases and write it so that no one could understand it, or you could write it so that it's completely perceptible. So, um, you know, you're right. I mean, although one of the things I, that one of the things that, that I do, um, my Bard kids, because of the way I sort of structure the courses, come from all over the the spectrum of the various fields. So I have science students in the class. And, and it's very interesting to me because, because they know things that I don't know and can understand things that I can't understand. To see them come in with passages that they think are full of jargon and translate them into, into uh, terms that most of us can, can understand. So it's, it's a, you know, you're right, it's a much harder challenge. But, uh, but I'm, I guess I'm also I'm talking mostly about the humanities, which, which are, are the vocabulary is the English, you know, the fairly simple English language. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the, th I found many things interesting about your talk, and what I wanted to press you a little bit on is writing about what you see um, in relation to James's question. Um, because you yourself acknowledged that um, reading Rosalind Krauss years later, that language was no longer as foreign as it had appeared to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell from everything that you said um, that you're a brilliant teacher. Um, and every piece of writing that you offered was, I would agree, um, well-crafted. Um, I'm not sure I would describe it as transparent, though. So, so I wanted to think about writing about what you see in this sense, that sometimes when people look, they don't see how, in the way that the writers you cite, including yourself, see. Um, and is it possible that one of the desires of the writer who introduces terms like splayed frontality um, is to defamiliarize, right? So, so to enable the student who thinks, looking at that sculpture, it's just a bunch of big metal objects, right? Um, we'll see it in relation to Manet's Olympia or, or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, so so um, because I, I guess you know, I'm struck by the fact that the the brilliant writers you cite see well, see differently. They see transparently in a different way, in the kind of Emersonian sense, right, of the transparent eyeball. Um, they don't have that kind of sense of well, it's just there. Can't you see it? Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it um, and so I just wanted to hear more about um, what, how to get people to see um, that the object isn't as self-evident as they might first have thought. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is the answer, but, uh, or any answer to your question, but, but when I teach, um, I only teach close reading. I don't really, I don't really like teaching other ways. I mean, for all sorts of, you know, and, and, and also close reading naturally evolves into things that are larger. But, but when in, in class, we really do things word by word, line by line. I mean, we can spend, you know, and I warn the students, it's like the most tedious thing that's ever happened. But in fact, it's not. And, and, and we're talking about language. We're just talking about language. And, and as I said, it, you know, I hope evolves into something larger. There's nothing larger, but something, something else. So, so that may, for, in a way, that makes it very easy for me and for the students, because we're not, we're just, you know, we're just, we can spend 10 minutes talking about one adjective or one noun or and you know and and for example to give them an idea of alternative choices or the range of choices or other words the writer could have used or how how a writer is transmitting information in a way that you don't even know that information is being transmitted but you can figure it out nonetheless so um, so so that's one way of of helping them to see what's there you know not saying look at this 
huge thing and try and see the pieces of it, but saying, look at the pieces and then try and see the whole thing from that. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't work for everyone, but for, for when I've been teaching in my classes, it, uh, it, it, it works. And it's fun. Hi. I really agree with you about the need for academic writers to be clear. But then I was thinking about an opposite danger, which I think kind of came up when you talked about how your friend responded when you told him about how you felt about reading Rosalind Krauss. And he said, well, you know, this jargon is, it's not charming. And what I felt about the passages that you read about the, like, um, the descriptions of Caravaggio was that was very charming writing, perhaps even to the extent that it almost kind of, especially with the way it used you, like you mentioned, it kind of almost flatters the reader a little bit. And, and that writing had, its, had a little bit of its own jargon too, like when he referred to the, the horrified naturalism of St. Peter's face. Oh, I don't know exactly what that would mean, but it's kind of like one of those terms which it's like low jargon. It can kind of catch, catch the <laughs> reader and get them to think, ah, yes, but in fact, maybe not. Um, so that other danger of being charming, I think, is maybe the other pole of this thing where you get the writer to think that they understand maybe what you're saying when nobody's being clear necessarily. <laughs> well, I don't, two things. First of all, I, when I was copying out these um, passages in the Caravaggio book, I decided to put them in, even though I was horrified to realize that I'd use the you, the second person, because I really don't believe in it. I really don't, I mean, as a, as a critical, I just can't, you know, because, in a way, I mean, the Sanford Schwartz, who's, who's the, the writer on Watteau, was a student of, of Pauline, a disciple of Pauline Kael's, and, and a lot of that you comes from Pauline, I mean, that, you know, she kind of really brought you into the, into the discourse. I, I, don't, I don't understand why charm and, and clarity are charm and education or charm and, and the ability to elucidate uh, can't coexist. I don't, I don't think of charm as, a, as, a, as an escape from those other burdens. I think, as, I think of it as a, you know, it's somehow sugarcoating, if you want to call it that, the, the, the pill of education, but that's fine with me. I mean, you know, why not? I mean, I, just, I also think that there's, that I really do think that, um, that there's something awful about boredom. I mean, you know, I, and, and I don't, you know, I, I, I mean, there's a great John Berriman Palmer, what's he say, you know, my mother always told me that people who are bored have no inner resources, but I am heavy bored. Well, you're not supposed to admit that you're bored, but ever. But in fact, there are lots of things that are boring to read, and, and I don't see why that's, you know, not everything will bore everybody, obviously. But, but I think it's, it's one thing for writers of, of anything, really, to ask themselves, is this boring? You know, is, this, can, is it possible to do this in a way that's call it charming or call it entertaining and, and get the same message across as you might if you're writing in a, in a much less, uh, you know, appealing way. I don't know, you know. I, I, but I just don't think those two things are, 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 I think they're rarely mutually exclusive, let me put it that way. But I do think, you know, I agree with you. I do think the second person is, you know, I read it and it, it is coercive. It's, it's, you know, you read it and you think, what do you mean me? You know, you, 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 you. How do you know what I'm thinking? How do you know what you, you know? So I don't, I don't really like it, but there I was using it. So it's one of those things. Is we any less coercive? Well, the, well, the trouble is, what pronoun are you going to use? You know, I mean, one is, you know, one has its problems. We, you know, there's I. I mean, there's a choice, but it's limited. <laughs> I just was wondering if you thought that Freud was uh, 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 using jargon, or or was he charming, or what? Oh well, Freud, Freud was a great writer. You can read Freud. I mean, you can just. I have, well, I have the complete works of Freud on my. I hate to say it, Kindle, and I just and I just read it for fun because he was such a good writer. I mean, even in in 
I, you know, I don't know because I don't, you know, not reading other languages, I can't gauge what the translations are like, but, but the case histories are just pure pleasure to read. Just, you know, they, they read like novels. I mean, he invented, he invented a language in a, a certain way, you know, terminology that's become jargonized, certainly, but, um, but to read Freud himself is, is a great pleasure. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. I enjoyed it a lot, and I, I agree totally with you. And I was wondering, what kind of reactions have you got from the academic world? I mean, because you're judging them, and you're. This is the only time I've. I, just, I wrote it for today. This is the only time. But you know, I. It's funny. It's I am. Um, I. I feel a little. I feel a little wary. I mean, that is when I teach my students to write this way. Some of them are going to go on into academia, and and I feel that 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 for better or worse, they'd better learn to write in that other way because no one is going to. You know, they have to. To get your PhD thesis passed in some fields, you have to write in, a, in, in that other way. And, and in fact, you know, one of the ways I learned, I lear I, you know, that, I, that I, um, I became so interested in the subject, I've been, my daughter in law is a graduate student in, in a PhD candidate in anthropology, and um, English is her second language. So I've been, you know, I look over her papers, and, and she's a genius, so it's not a problem usually, but there are these. Uh, there are these problems that crop up, one of which is that she's, uh, Spanish is her original language, is that all the words like, furthermore, however, therefore, she just never bothered to learn what each one means. So she just kind of throws them in at random for, you know, as, as connectives. And, and, or, you know, I mean, I was, the last thing of hers that I was, you know, just reading over for mistakes, uh, she would say, it was this phrase and it was like, um, interestingly enough, and then would follow something so boring, and she knew it was boring. I mean, it was, and it, I noticed that she was using that every time she had no interest, whatever, in the thing she was about to say. So, um, so, but, but, I, but th that's how I learned about subjects and actors, because when when she was writing these papers, and I kept changing actors to subjects, and then she would change it back to actors, and I finally I went what, and and we were all on vacation, and I picked up a book from her um, anthropology, uh, you know, from her doctoral program, and it was actor, 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 and I suddenly realized that that subjects was not, you just didn't use that word anymore, you just said actors, so you know, so I think it's you know, I, for better or worse. I think that for, for students in certain programs, it's a language and it's a language you have to learn. And, but then once you get out, you, I think um, you have a choice about whether you can use that whether you need to use that language or not. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Anyway, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all. <laughs>